Welcome to Leader Podcast, the ultimate destination for med tech insights, leadership inspiration, and the latest innovation. I'm Stephanie Plia, founder of Tribe Agency and your host for Leader Podcast. Get ready to be inspired by our next guest on Leader Podcast. She's not only a master at designing high-performing cultures, but she's also a personal friend and mentor to me. Please welcome Stacy Porter, Chief People Officer at Outset Medical. With deep expertise in organizational design, innovative talent practices, and employee engagement, Stacy is a sought-after speaker on building high-performance cultures and developing skills for the future workplace. She also holds a master's in social work and a PhD in organizational psychology, making her a true expert. So I am so excited and excited isn't even the right word. I need to find something far more profound, but I have the pleasure of having Stacy Porter on today's leader podcast. She is serving as our episode three guest speaker, and I'd like to just introduce Stacy to leader. So I, Steph, I'm so glad to be here. You know, anything you ask is like a guaranteed yes for me. So (laughs) this is, this is a joy. Perfect. I have a list of many other things I'm going to ask you for down the road. This is this you, is the easy you should. stuff. You should. I'm 100% <laughs> yes with you. <laughs> well, honestly, I am such a fan of Stacey Porter, and I know everyone that's tuned in today is equally a fan. And so Leader Podcast, as you probably heard in the introduction, is really around the med tech and med device industry, but also around the leaders that are centered within it. And it's here to help inspire future leaders or even current leaders and also CEOs of med tech companies and specifically emerging med tech companies where they want what we have, right? If we've been in some big company success, I want to try and share that playbook with those that come after us and and try to enlighten them. So Stacy is a dear friend, but also just someone I look up to immensely and just an incredible person. Like I said, I can't find the words to quite describe you because I feel like God broke the mold when they when he made you. <laughs> but I do want to get into your background and a lot of our conversation today is going to be around your role as a chief people officer, but also um, just your overall origin story for leadership. So let's start there. Yeah. Let's start at the beginning and then we've got a lot to cover. So Specifically, Stacey, I met you when you were already in a leadership position, but I'd love to know what the origin story was. Take us back to, you know, your first leadership job and how that kind of evolved into current day. Yeah, I love that stuff. So, you know, it, it's funny, and I even feel like uncomfortable with the with the term leader because I feel like I'm kind of like a free radical in like uh, in the organizational world. Um, but I, I, a couple of things I hold really dear. I, I do always believe in people um, and I believe in their potential and I believe in ordinary people coming together and doing something extraordinary. And I, that is really deeply ingrained in me, but it's ingrained from my parents. Um, I have uh, an exceptional family. I've got parents who just always told me that I could do anything if I put hard work into it. Um, and they believed in talent, but they believed in determination and grit. And so that that really kind of started uh, for me early on. In fact, um, I've got four parents. My parents are divorced and remarried, so I have four amazing parents. But two of mine are educational activists. And they have always believed that anyone can learn anything with the right support mechanisms. And I'm, I'm kind of of that cloth, too. But but I think what would be useful stuff as far as the origin story would be, you know, maybe just kind of like kicking out of college yeah. and I was um, going into a master's program. I had this like vision for myself. I think I'd watch like The Sopranos and like Lorraine Bracco was so cool as like a therapist who worked in a living room. And I was like, oh, my God, that needs to be me. I need to I need to work in a living room. So I was uh, getting my master's in social work and um, at the time to support myself through my master's because my parents were like one degree on us, the rest on you. um, I had a sales job. So in my master's, I was learning what I thought was going to be like my life craft. And in my sales job, I was like, oh, 
listen, I'm not a salesperson. Like I'm not going to do this forever. Like I have a real job coming. <laughs> I but, love how everyone uh, says that, by the way, as a former but, salesperson and sales leader myself, they get a bad rap. They keep the lights on and they bring the revenue in. So we have to honor them. But yes, everyone thinks I don't want to be known as a salesperson. So that's funny that you say that. But, but Steph, here's the funny thing. So in my master's program, it was like all of this, hey, humans are deeply flawed. Everybody has these pathologies. Let's just try to bring them up to like a normal citizen level so they can like pass in the world. And in my sales job, it was like, hey, you collective with these complementary skills work generously together and achieve as a group. And so I got totally disconnected from this master's program. I got totally connected to the sales team. And it really shaped the course of my, my trajectory. I went into organizational psychology. As you know, I started studying teams and I started studying organizations and, and um, really work and, and how human beings put goal centric, you know, kind of desires into practice and how they formed habits around that. So that's, that's kind of the origin story. What type of sales job was it? It was an orthopedic, a medical device, orthopedic sales rep job. I was selling um, a like durable medical equipment for when uh, sports medicine patients had like joint reconstruction. Got it. I didn't know you carried a bag. Look at you. Yes, Stacey ma'am. Porter. I did. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Hell yeah, I did stuff. I'll Street just... cred. <laughs> Try to get me to sell you something, babe. It'll work. <laughs> Oh, you sold me my entire time. Let's let's talk about that for a second. How we met. Uh, it was a, it's an odd pairing, but one that you know I I try to keep my circle tight. But you know, even back to the origin story of tribe, I always want to center myself around people that are better than me. And that's not saying anything about me, but I definitely want someone that's going to elevate my game and elevate me as a human. And when I first met you, I think it, we were trying to figure this out in our pre-call the other day, but I think I first met you at our management development class or one of the WISE events uh, where you were a guest speaker at, at Intuitive. And we both worked at Intuitive. And I remember I was just like obsessed. I'm like, who is this person and how do I get to know what she's got going on? And then I think I kind of corporate stalked you for a while. Um, <laughs> And then shortly after I fell in love with you, you left Intuitive and everyone's heart broke. I mean, honestly, and there are people that leave and you're like, eh, but then there are people like you that leave and you're like, wow, where'd she go? I need to follow her. <laughs> but, and that's not blowing smoke. That's just my sincere opinion on you. I, you're just, you've got this special knack and it's interesting that you reference your parents because if your parents are listening today i want to give a shout out to your parents all sets because as a parent myself i would love to know how i did as a as a parent of three boys later in life right yeah. um stacy is the most amazing human i've ever come into contact with and she was raised right she is empathetic as the day is long she's the corporate brene brown I mean, she really is just such a good hearted person, yet she's not just that one layer. She's also a really gregarious, fun, engaging. I was thinking about you this morning as I was prepping for this and I was thinking, Stacy for sure has never met a stranger. Do you know that term? <laughs> totally. Yes. Right. That's you. I mean, I could picture you at a bus stop in New York and you'd be best friends by the time you guys get on the bus. That's just who you are. And it's obvious that there was a family of origin that influenced that. So shout out to your parents. Great job. She is literally one of the best people I've ever worked with and uh, will continue to be friends with, hopefully for but, years but Steph, to come. I have to interrupt you because I, I don't think you do know our origin story. What is our origin about, story? You, you talked about corporate stalking. What you don't remember is you had been at the national sales meeting. Okay. You were up on stage and you were giving a talk about a surgery you had had to oh, have one of your children. I remember that. And you had just been dynamic and raw and real. And you were just talking about the, the process your husband and you had gone through to potentially have one more baby. And after that, I like beeline to you. And I was just like foaming at the mouth. I was like, 
you're amazing. And how vulnerable was that? And how, what a peek into like something so private and so kind of real and, and kind of ups and downs to, to have this kind of full family that you and your husband envision. So I fell in love with you way before that management development program. Baby. Who knew? Who knew? Mutual affection. <laughs> well, That's the funny right. thing about that particular day, and yes, I remember that all too well. I don't know if you know the backstory to that. However, it's a good one. I, I don't have time on this podcast to get into it. Anyone that knows the backstory, John Conta and a few others, I believe Barbara also remembers this. Um, but the backstory was the person that was supposed to be the patient on the stage in front of 1500 people um, had some trouble the night before we were in Vegas and ah. I was the stand in and I was given 24 hour notice that I would be the patient on the stage. <laughs> and honestly, it ended up working out really well because I think if I knew anything prior to 24 hours, I would have been completely paralyzed with that big of an audience and speaking on such a intimate conversation. Uh, but it all worked out in the end. John Conta is a legend and handled it perfectly. And so I think he's really the reason why I felt even remotely natural that day. But Steph, you just, you just walked right into that. I think that the ability for you to share kind of how these hopes felt like they were being dashed. And then all of a sudden you had a Da Vinci procedure and, and now you have this, these three boys, as you talked about, I, I was drawn to how intimate I felt like I was having a connection with you in a room of thousands of people. So it was that a is a skill. Not a lot of people have babe. Well, thank you. And by the way, we do have a Da Vinci baby. His name is Beckham James Plia. I just dropped him off at Junior Guards this morning, first day of summer officially. He's now 10. But yes, he was the reason why I had the fibroid removed and out came Beckham. So shout out to Intuitive and Da Vinci for that one. All right. right. So I have more questions for you, my dear. Now that we've I'm figured ready. out how we know each other <laughs> and we'll continue to know each other, you know, there's other parts of our origin story, including, you know, multiple times we've spoken and met even after you left Intuitive and you've served as a great mentor to me. And you've also, you're just a good person to bounce things off of when you're struggling or you need a second opinion that you really value. And we'll get back to the, the drinks that night. I think it was shortly after the pandemic and we'll talk through that kind of what we discussed, but let's talk more about you. So We've talked about a little bit of your origin story for leadership and that you had started out with the masters, then you thought you were going to maybe carry a bag. And then who gave you your first leadership job and what did that look like? And then how did that make its way all the way up to chief people officer, which Ooh, I, I, I would say that. it's more I'm on like the HR side of corporate, but you can tell me if that's not. Yeah. So actually I do want to make that distinction because it's an important one. But um, so, so if I, I found myself at a crossroads, honestly, Steph, I was like, listen, I think this master's is going to like suck my will to live because I'm not going to be able to like work in this paradigm. Um, and I love this sales job, but I don't know if I see that is like my path. And so what I did is I actually moved to Chicago um, with my then boyfriend, now husband, and I went to graduate school. So I went to graduate school uh, at Illinois Institute of Technology. I was in a doctoral program for organizational psychology. I worked during that program um, as a consultant. So I was a consultant in a couple different arenas, really around employee engagement, performance, um, matching kind of intentions with behavior um, and and really honed my craft as an academic, but also as a practitioner. I am very much, and you know me only this way, but my early, early days were pretty scientific, pretty research-based. And then um, I moved into a real practitioner role. And I'm, I'm proud of that jump because um, sometimes as an academic, you can get really just eggheady and you're kind of around these ideal concepts, but you don't know how they actually play out. Yeah. You don't practice. put them into practical use. Yes. Not, not at all. And I am very much like that cultural anthropologist. Like I go live in systems and just <laughs> uh, immerse myself. So Chicago was, was part of my academic career. Then my, um, 
then boyfriend becoming a husband said, Hey, listen, I can't live in a place where you have to wear a winter coat in June. So I think we should get out of here. Um, and we moved to California. He started an architecture firm. Uh, he's still one of my just Uber mentors uh, and just kind of the, the first person I want to bounce ideas off of because he's so successful in his own right. And I um, started looking for a job. So it was 2004, Steph. It was the worst time ever to be somebody with a squishy skill set because <laughs> nobody knew what to do with the you. soft skills. <laughs> soft skills, right? Like a, 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 this was a time, especially in Silicon Valley, where like nobody was hiring. Mm -hmm. And if they had anybody who kind of looked like a squishy knowledge worker, they were like out the door with like a box of like, you know, their books and plants and whatever. Um but I eventually found a role at Roche Pharmaceuticals, which is a big Swiss company. They mm -hmm. were 80,000 people when I joined, and they have since grown to over 100,000. They also acquired um, the remaining shares of Genentech, so they've got a big footprint uh, in the pharma world. But I started there. My first leadership role was in a learning and development capacity, and they did not have this role before. Right. So I came in. I was their first learning and development professional and it was a fantastic opportunity because I had never worked with people this smart. Most of them had like MD, PhDs, or they were like toxicologists or chemists or computational modelers or all kinds of these job titles that you're like, I don't even understand what that person does. Right. Um, but it, but it was, it was fantastic. And I really got to learn the business of drug development and did a lot of work with our leaders around teams, around you know, being kind of diplomats of our business purpose, um, got got really involved in like bringing new people in and helping them on board, um, got really connected to change management and change principles. And I I loved that job. It was um, it was really something that I look back on and felt like it was that first big leap of mine into kind right. of like becoming the person I wanted to be. Right. I feel like you kind of got your degree in an area of interest and then you over time wore people down and got them to create a role since they weren't really did they didn't really exist. I mean, now we live in a super squishy world. I mean, you could write the book on squishy in this new cultural environment where everything's soft and almost too soft for me. <laughs> but, you know, now it's like I gotta believe it's it's in high demand and it almost is maybe close to a gummy bear at this point, like maybe a little too squishy. Um, let's talk about that. I do have it on my list of things to talk about. Let's talk about just culture in general and kind of how you think leadership principles have evolved in the 21st century and in current day. And But also just the cultures changed, at least I witnessed it post-pandemic to pre-pandemic from being remote and everything that comes with that. So this is, you know, your lot in life. It's certainly not mine. I was just on the receiving end of it as an employee. So tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, you know, actually, Steph, I love that you talked about the gummy bear because you're right. Like, look at these books behind me. <laughs> like, Obviously, like I've bought into the $3 billion like business book on, you know, self-development. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I would say is I, I was like, born at the right time. Like I found myself in industry at the right time because I believe very much in the potential of human beings. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I found my path at a perfect time when, when companies were realizing that employees um, had more power as a lobby, they had more kind of collective like intelligence and just individual intelligence. And they were starting to invest in ways to make organizations more cohesive now, I do think that I have been in environments that have allowed me to use evidence-based information, but also as a practitioner, try things to see if you could create community. And, and so I've, I've been lucky enough to, to be a person who can influence that it's safe enough to try these things and also be able to be in environments that are open to, you know, doing some different things uh, as far as kind of blending people together. But what I'll tell you is I think over the past 10 years, we've mm -hmm. learned a couple of things. We've learned that people really want to be challenged. They do want to be challenged. I mean, a human being is goal centric. Mm 
Yeah. And there is no greater joy in life than accepting a challenge, working through it and achieving it. That, that is like, that is joy in, in somebody's life. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is human beings are social. They're tribal, just like the name of your agency staff. Yeah. And tribes come together. And when they can come together with their egos to the side and do something important, unbelievably heroic things can happen. It has throughout history. Right. I think the other thing is there is this sense that you can learn until you're dead. <laughs> so yeah. we might as well evolve. I mean, I don't want to die at 25 and still live to 75. That would be right. terrible. So, so I think there is this sense of, I want to be challenged. I want to work with great people and I want to evolve. And I think workplaces are getting smart about designing systems and structures to really buy into that kind of mentality. Right. So you had asked a bit about pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think a couple things there. Pre-pandemic, we were still very much, employers had a lot of power. Yes. Um, I think post pandemic employees had a lot of power, right? Like this great oh, resignation to, was almost swung way too far the other way. It was the it, inmates running the asylum. <laughs> right. And, yes. and, and, and it was, but it was like the great resignation was fascinating because it was, I was a part of it. <laughs> you saw this migration, right? Yeah. Where people were like, I'm not, I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah. Like I'm doing my own thing. And sometimes that worked out exceptionally well. For you, it did. You started the agency of your dreams. You yep. knew how to take your skill set and manifest it. But honestly, Steph, a lot of people had buyer's remorse on that. And they mm -hmm. left jobs that were actually great and went to things that were actually more lonely or right. they found challenge making connection. And then it was like the great realization that, oh, shit, I really fucked up. <laughs> right. But But I do think there was this sense that employers, employees did like, they did take that power yeah. dynamic, just, just, just to kind of too far of an extreme. Um, and so I think we're trying to write ourselves yeah. and I think we're trying to write ourselves in a way where employee employers have to have a framework of operation because at the end they've got stakeholders internally and externally, and they have, you know, people on the receiving end of their products and they've got a mission and the reason they exist employees joining those organizations have to know the rules of the road. You know, at times they want to influence them and they want to help that organization grow and scale and evolve. And a lot of times great ideas come from the employee ranks. It's a balance. Okay. Got it. There's so much to say and there's so much to unpack on that. Um, before I ask you one question that came to mind, um, I want to go back and just reinforce. So the, the disparity for me as an employee is I do like structure and I'm super competitive and I like structure with a purpose. I don't like structure just for sake of structure and it's really nuanced and nothing comes of it. But if there's structure and expectations, I always told my reps in the past that clarity lessens anxiety. So if you know what's expected Absolutely. of you, then you go after it. You know, and if you're one that doesn't need a lot of direction, you run hard, right? But when everything's loosey goosey and soft and everybody gets a trophy for overachiever alpha type A personalities, that's not fun. No. It's it's not fun. It's not motivating. It's you feel yourself like getting it. It's like contagious. And I felt like for me, you know, I got to a point in my career where I felt like I was taking steps back versus forward as far as getting challenged and doing things that stretched my brain and also stretched my abilities and added to me. So I think, you know, everyone's got to make their own decision on what their journey looks like and when it's done and when there's time to like create a new journey. But I just, I saw so much social experiment after the pandemic working in the corporate environment. There was just so much that came of it. And I think a lot of it came from anxiety. You know, everyone yeah. was freaked out and there was a lot in the headlines that caused everyone to get freaked out. But it also, I think goes back to your original point about people like to work in a tribe. I yeah. am very social and I like being around people. Because I think 
what might make someone mad if they don't know you and they're just showing up to a Zoom call and you say something snarky. But if you just had dinner with them the night before in the corporate office and you knew all about their family and they know about yours and they know you're a good person, that just rolls off the back, right? They're not even so listening. Uh, because it's like a deposit filled environment. You're giving way more deposits than withdrawals and the little hangnails don't get even discussed because nobody they sees don't. them. But I felt like towards the end of my time in corporate, it was like every hangnail was addressed and it drove mm -hmm. me nuts. It's just like, we all need to get a little pr perspective. <laughs> well, and, and Steph, I, I love that you said that because I'll be truthful. I, come off like a heretic sometimes about some of these things because I don't totally believe in the whole burnout culture. Yeah. I believe in peak performance. So I believe that you create an environment where people can be very, very potent versions of themselves, but they have to choose that. Yes. And I mean, I'll tell you just like for myself, I train for this job. I I find time to think. I like exercise all the time. I don't eat sugar. Like I have all these like weird things to make sure that like my brain is engaged in the right. highest capacity way. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's, that's what I need to bring to this. I have employees and I have a business that needs me to think deeply about things and not have strong perspectives that are loosely examined. My perspectives are point. strong. Yes, but they're strongly examined. That's a good point. Yeah. You are one of the most open people I have met. And I would love to really break down what you really think, but I think I actually know what you really I think, think. You're I say open it. to at this point. I say it. <laughs> you're, I mean, you're open. You're, you're yeah. not someone that's so convicted in one way that it's the only way. And I think that that's noble. I think you may have your approach, but you're open to hearing other approaches that give you the same result. And, and as Absolutely. am I, I'm all about results. So yeah. if someone can teach me a better way or a faster way to get the same result or a better result, I'm all in, right? Um, okay, so let's talk about workplace since we've kind of evolved into this workplace conversation. What sure. are you excited about in this new workplace, remote or not? And what keeps you up at night as a chief people officer? Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> so much there. At 2 a.m. I am literally walking around the house. I'm like, how do I think about this? No, here, here's what I'm excited about in the workplace. Okay. I, I'm excited about how incredible it is that we have tools that connect us um, with higher fidelity than ever before. Mm -hmm. I love that you and I are, we've got miles between us, but it feels like we're in the same room. So there is this real movement to be able to use tools and technology to connect people so they can get work done. At the same time, I think that work has never been less productive. <laughs> so I think, I think often our meetings aren't very productive and I think we don't really like examine why. I think sometimes we're a little bit loose on goal setting and accountability. I, I am a real um, advocate of very robust information flow. And I think sometimes companies, as they get bigger, information becomes like, it's almost like plaque in arteries. It starts to get clogged in certain places. And, and there, there can be a sense as companies get bigger that employees are like, wait, I don't really know what's going on. I feel like maybe I'm getting to the fringe. Oh, maybe I don't belong. Oh, maybe I should move on. And yeah. that's, that's really heartbreaking to me. So, so I think that work needs to remind itself how to get productive again. And that's really about simplicity. I also get, um, I, I'm never more thrilled than when I can actually watch, not in a creepy way, um, a very high performing team. I love to watch high performing teams and they have a couple of qualities. They are unambiguous about why they came together and what they're there to do. They also are incredibly uh, mature about putting their own agenda and their own ego to the side to focus on the mission. And when it's time to disband, they know it's over and they disband and they move on to whatever is their next calling. I'm fascinated by high-performing teams and they actually do really the incredible in organization. So that that's my joy in the workplace. What keeps me up at night, Steph, honestly, is I worry that we're losing the ethos of hard work. 
for for me, a job well done that feels hard that I know I left everything in, in the room or everything on the table, or I used to be a swimmer. So I used to say everything in the pool that there is nothing more satisfying than that. And I think I, I would hate for somebody to go through their life and never feel that sense of real accomplishment and what they can do under their own steam. So I, I appreciate the mental health dialogue. But I also really appreciate how people can think of being the most peak version of themselves and how they can train for that. And then once they're there, how they can contribute those strengths and put them on display. And, and one of the things I, I often tell people in our organization is I said, listen, your boundaries are your own. If you make them inconvenient, guess what? I'll trample all over them because I'll take everybody your intelligence every bit of your strengths and I'll use them. And you would, you should want me to. And you just described why we are best friends. <laughs> <laughs> See, because I 100%, if I could give it another 101% agree with you on that. Um, I personally subscribe to high performance teams and I even started every team. I inherited teams. I developed teams. I started them from scratch. And the first thing we'd say on the whiteboard session for anyone listening that's been on any of my teams is we're a high performance team. If you're coming to kick your feet up on the on the couch, this is not the team for you. And it's setting that stage, setting that expectation and also rolling up your sleeves and getting out in the field with your crew and doing exactly what you're preaching. You can't be a high performance team from an ivory tower, but I'm all about high performance just breeds excitement. And yeah. uh, in fact, the one of the years at Intuitive, our team was so fired up, we had a mission statement for our own team. And it was be phenomenal or be forgotten. And so I, I went out love. and got everyone t shirts. And then we went and did paintball, um, a little paintball thing. And they all shot me. And I literally think that's where I got my blood clot in my neck from. But that's a whole other story. They but just that killed is, me. That's the step, <laughs> Plea, I know. They're like, go, go big or just don't even show up. Don't get out of bed. Yeah. But I mean, as a leader, and I think that's what you're describing here, it's on us to keep people rising, rising high, you know, raise yeah. the bar. Don't settle for mediocrity. It's like the death of overachievement in meritocracy is kind of seized. And I don't want that to happen because like you said, there's lessons in being challenged. There's lessons yeah. in being on a great team. Um, you know, a couple of my teams, one in the Orange County, we used to call them OC something, OCSD or something like that. We got team of the year because yeah. we were so fired up and we were all like very dear friends to each other. And that's all it is. It's all about who you work with and how much you care and picking up an oar when someone's down. But if you're all disconnected and you're all on Zoom calls all day long and the leader isn't really bringing you guys together and created that union and creating that expectation of a high performance team, then everyone's on their own. And they're just yeah. using their own pilot light, whatever that is, if it's dimly lit or it's a hurricane in their body, you know, and they're kind of using their own gauge. Whereas you set the tone and you say, this is a high performance team and we hire high performers and the expectation is that we deliver the results. So That's that right. just like literally spoke my language. I think one of the other things for me is I am always obsessed with something. And I, that's even the, the language I use. You know me. Same. I, mean, I, yeah. I, I, in fact, I've gotten to the point where like my, even people in my network are like, okay, Stace, what are you obsessed with this year? Um, and I'm, I am, I'm like, wait, I'm obsessed with managers. Like I'm going to build the best managers in the universe. And people are like, well, that's a little bit insane. I'm like, not to me. Um, or I'll be obsessed with, you know, productivity and how do we think about like when we come together, making sure that that time is used really, really well. Or I just, I'll be obsessed with progress in some way. And, and I think that once you, you identify that breadcrumb of what your organization needs you to do and you just become obsessed with it, it, it really is a focus. You can really just kind of dampen out noise. Um, 100%. And so I do, I do love it when I see people who are just, 
they're obsessed with something. They know it's yeah. the right thing. They know they're the person who's called up to, you know, to, to, to help, you know, move that, create momentum or move that ball forward. And so I, I love obsession in people. Your obsession is contagious and that's what makes you great. <laughs> So keep doing what you're doing. And it actually was a phenomenal segue. You should come back and do a podcast number two, because I had on my notes to ask you about mission and vision, because several of my med tech clients, they're all in the pre-commercial stage. So they're, yeah. most of them have a very nimble marketing team, pre-sales. They're more, more than likely doing a 1099 Salesforce and they're farming out through tribe, their marketing intention, launch strategy, brand strategy. And a lot of what goes into the brand strategy is what do they want to be best known for? And nine times out of 10, I have found the CEO, when I ask them the question, what's the mission? What's the vision? And then also, what do you want to be best known for? Because that's what all the marketing and branding effort needs to convey, right? Yeah. They're all thumbs. They're all thumbs or they think that that's like too soft. It's not meaningful. And I wholeheartedly disagree. Oh, um, I and I would too. love to get your thoughts as a chief people officer. You have a lot more pedigree in this than I do or credentials in that. So what are your thoughts? And then I'll, I'll finish with my thoughts on that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, honestly, Steph, I, I love the mission and vision concept. And I'll tell you why. A mission is the reason that you exist. It is the reason that you have a job inside a company versus having that role be farmed out to somebody else. <laughs> and you should know right. what that is. So for me, I, you know, my mission in this company or, or when I've been across different companies is always the same. It is enable employees to do the best work of their career. You, you reduce that friction, give them, you know, avenues to create connection, connect people to people, connect people to information, connect people to tools. Make that is my job. Make it yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the other thing for me, I, I always do have a vision. And sometimes it is around, you know, hey, I want high performing people for 36 months. I want high performing people in this company for three years. And you might say, well, why does that matter? Don't you want them forever? You want them for as long as you can get them. As long as they're potent, as long as they're high performing, you want them. However, in the Valley, the average tenure is 2.1 years. That's that not right? a long time to get deep. Is that so just that, a that, recent statistic? It's, it's within the last year. It just means okay. that what's happening are that people's time within companies yeah. over the years, over the last 10 to 15 years has gotten dramatically shorter. So our average tenures used to be, you know, much longer, six years, seven years, maybe yep. 10, it, it come down and come down to the point that now, you know, 2.1, people are not staying in companies that long. Right. So if they're not staying in companies that long, you have teams that come together and you've got skill sets that are available for a short amount of time. Yeah. So how do you create structures where people say it's valuable and it's viable for me to stay here? longer than 2.1 years. Hey, right. I'm going to see myself there for three years. Hey, I'm going to see myself there for four years. And we do know that often in companies, especially in knowledge working jobs, the year between like the second and third year, like after two years, that year between kind of, you know, ending, uh, you know, ending a second year and moving into a third year, people get really good at their jobs because right. they've got great connections. They know the systems you know, they, they know how to navigate. They've got a savviness. They've got the language. They've adopted the rituals. You know, they're bought in. They're two feet in. Right. So oftentimes, you know, between year and two, people get exceptionally good at what they're doing. And then that's what you're saying is the average year that they leave, right? Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. I wonder if it's because the working class or those that are kind of going into these corporate type jobs are younger now. And, you know, early in my career, I hopped from job to job to job in my 20s just because I was building revenue. Right. And yeah. I really didn't know where my true north was and I didn't have a huge amount of loyalty. And then once I found my real passion for my first company, I stayed there for 12 years until we were acquired. The whole company got acquired by Fujifilms. But I, you know, once you find it, even if you're young, um, you can stay the long haul, but it's because that particular company really built a culture 
that was a family culture. We had a mission and vision that was constantly referenced to us and always kept it right in front of us. And then I would say the same for intuitive, my time in intuitive, you know, I was there for 12 years. The one thing that kept me going um, back in the day when we talked about driving the curve, we would start with each specialty and then just take it all the way to the top and then start on the next specialty. But always in the back of my mind was that patient first, always. always. And we literally lived that. And I was a patient and half my family were patients. And so for me, that was really meaningful. And it's what kept me, even in the good days or the bad days, staying the course because it was all about giving access to minimally invasive surgery to all patients and not That's having right. to op open them up. And so that was a really meaningful mission and vision to me. And I'm trying to find a way to convey that to these emerging CEOs. Right now, they're just focused on rounds of finance and keeping the lights on, right? And so, and good for them. That's really what they should be. But I think there's always a cornerstone. You need to decide what you do really well and what you want to be best known for. You also need to decide what you stand for. What are your corporate tenants? You know, what are you going to stand for? What are you going to take from your employees? And then also, what are we shooting for? And if everyone has different arrows, then they're off. But if you can really get something that people can get behind, people will give it up their all, or at least from my experience, and I think yours, you know, you'll go after the mission all day long, as long as it's continually reinforced. Well, and Steph, you said some really important things there. So let me actually unpack you a little bit. Mm -hmm. The first is when your personal values line up with what the organization's trying to do, that's a, that's a great match. Right. When you, so, so if you join a company, we joined intuitive, both mm -hmm. of us felt really strongly about having a different avenue of healthcare that made surgery safer. Yeah. I mean, right. End it was of story. Safer. Yeah. End of story. Like the, the, the recovery was better. Mm -hmm. Patients got back to work and they felt like people again, yep. who can't get behind that. And we were both, we're both women. So we yep. knew that gynecological procedures could be in our future. There was one mm -hmm. uh, that was in yours and we wanted a safer option so we could get behind that. The other thing is I always want a job that is is going to develop me, but is going to allow me to use the strengths that I natively have. Exactly. If I've got strengths that are useful in the workplace, I want to put them on display. And I want a job that allows me to do that. And then I think the third thing is when you work with great people, it doesn't feel like a job. It feels like a calling. It feels like you're coming into like this coalition totally. yeah. of people who like you run in the door. You're like, oh, I can't wait to see these people. Oh my God, it's Monday. I can't wait. Like I'm done with the weekend. This, yeah. My, my, my three at home, I'm over you. I'm, <laughs> I'm going back to like my work family. But it, it, so, so I, think it's, I think it's a company that your values match up with. I think that it's challenge and it's ability to utilize your strengths. I think it's great people. And then I think as you evolve, you want to see that company evolve. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about the companies I've been in is if there is an ability to work ideas into an organization and make it better, that feels like oxygen. Right. Yes. And the opposite, if, if you have ideas that would be productive and they are not welcome or there is no inbox for them, then it can be, it can be stifling. So, and then what happens is you stop tendering those ideas. That's right. So they're only kind of like within you. And yeah. then that organization doesn't know it. It's dying. Yeah. <laughs> because now it, yeah, it's called silent. silent descent. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are rounding out and I, I have three questions that I ask each leader that comes on the podcast. But before we get that to that, I do have one other question that I was thinking about that I think would be really meaningful whether you're a CEO or you're a leader or a new leader or a seasoned leader, Stacy is the real deal. So listen up to her answer. And she didn't know I was going to ask this question. So I want to know what's the one thing that you would say to a new leader or a CEO having taking from experience that they could do to succeed and, you know, kind of what's the one thing that they could do to avoid failing so that's kind of a two-part question and you can wrap it all into one, but it's essentially what advice would you give a new CEO or a new leader based on your experience that could give them a leg up? 
Oh, gosh. I love this question, Steph. And I do have an answer for you because I've okay. seen CEOs do this exceptionally well and, and it really pay dividends. It's to become intimate with your people. Mm -hmm. It's to know them at all levels. It is to sit beside them in the cafeteria. It is to ask them if you're walking by what they're working on. But it is to put your ego to the side and become culturally an anthropologist. Live in your tribe. Live in your system. Um, totally understand agree. that your status is so powerful that when you walk down the corridor, meetings form around you. But when you are five levels down in the organization and you call a meeting, you're hoping that people will show up. <laughs> so, so understanding really that uh, a culture has cultures within it and you have to go and understand your people. So it, it's about intimacy. So, so that would be the first thing. The, the second thing, and I know you asked me for one, you're like, wait, you're breaking the rules already. No, it's, there's no um, rules on leader podcasts. Sing away. <laughs> the, the second one is to get your personal, get, get your personal performance in order. Mm -hmm. So eat well, like work out, sleep well, give, give, understand what your boundaries are and make them known and, and, and uphold them, but be in good working order is yeah. what I would say for any leader. You have to train for these jobs because the amount of decisions that we as leaders make in a day or really any knowledge worker with very patchy information, but with speed and you hope quality is staggering and you need to train for it. It's athletic. A hundred percent agree. There's a book that someone had recommended to me in my early leadership days. I wasn't aspiring to be a CEO in my twenties, but they gave me a book called How to Become a CEO and in that book, which is actually a great book, it's a very small read. I think I read it on a treadmill in one sitting, um, but it talks about balance. It talks about the best CEOs are functional. They have healthy marriages. They are not drug addicts or alcoholics. They're not sitting at, at the office till four in the morning and they're not coming in at three, right? They have balance. And, and the reason why balance is so important as a leader is people want to model you. If they're going to follow you, they need to be able to emulate you and be able to say, I want to be like that person. And so if you're this broken, and this has happened to me, I've had people above me, they're a mess, like their marriage is falling apart, their health, that they've gained 30 pounds. And I'm like, well, I never want that job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, they never see their kids. They very rarely see their wife. So I think that is everything for a super CEO is to be healthy and be the person that everyone wants to emulate. And then going back to what you had said originally, I know you didn't mean that only leaders of direct people need to be intimate with their people. I believe you also were saying this to the CEOs. Absolutely. Right? I Get out of your office. I'm Get saying into it the Yes. I'm saying it more to the CEOs, yes. which is it is very easy because you have so many things in a day that you're context switching into. Right. Just feel like you need to kind of like pull away and just sit in a chair and have like 11 hours of inactivity. Uh, you know, the sitting, they, what did they say? Sitting is the new smoking, but you know, just, just, you know, mental activity, but no physical activity. Yeah. Ah. The intimacy is important. And Steph, here's where I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. Yeah. on just to train for this role. Okay. You also do have to have fun. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, the cultures that feel the most vibrant to me and the most alive are when you have leaders who ha know how to have fun. Like they go on the bike ride with people or they, they go to the bar and they, you know, do a mezcal shot. Or I, I even was at with our team in Mexico and rode a mechanical bull and fell off at like seven and a half seconds. I we need like, to insert I video of that into this video <laughs> podcast. I'm going to get it and I'm going to have our video editor add that in a quick. I, think it, I think it exists somewhere. By All right. The way. We'll, we'll but find I think, it. <laughs> I think, I think life is too short to yeah. not have a little bit of fun and let people see you just have, have a bit too. of a, you know, a silly side. So, yeah. so I think that's important too. You know who, and I think you're going to agree with me, but you know who did that really well? I actually have two examples, one from Intuitive and one from my company that I worked for prior to Intuitive. Gary. Gary, yes. actually he scared me because I would be walking to go have a meeting with Glenn or someone else. And 
if Gary was in his office, he'd, he'd say, hey, Steph. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, is he talking to me? Don't talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> and he'd be like, come in here. Tell me what's, what's going on. He was a man of the people and loved to talk and loved to just get people's perspectives unplanned, which, of, co of course, was unnerving to a sales manager. But I loved that about him. Like, he didn't yeah. have an ego. And he genuinely wanted to know what was going on. And it was the most unnerving yet comforting conversation you can have um, because he didn't take himself seriously. He took the company very seriously and he appreciated people's thoughts and feedback. And he, I think he did it also to just read the tides. But that that was one. And then um, my former guest that was just on last week, Rhonda, she was the CEO of a couple of companies I worked for and also was just really intuitive and knew everyone from the janitor all the way up and titles didn't matter. Everyone was part of the same mission and vision and everybody had an opinion that mattered to her. And so totally reinforcing what you're saying. If you don't know your people from the top down, it's a huge miss because when people feel like you're invested, they will run through walls. And I mean, I've always said, I'll stay with Gary at the helm, I'll stay until the end of time because he is just that legit. Okay. Well, and, and and I have to tell you, I I have worked with some amazing CEOs. I mean, I, I Franz Humer, who was at Roche, was unbelievable. Step with what you said about certainty. Mm -hmm. He always said, "We're not going into Me Too drugs. We're mm -hmm. in novel applications." Like he he was. You you never had ambiguity with him. His right. message was always the same. I worked with Paul Moritz, who was the CEO at VMware, and he had come from Microsoft and, um, and had just been, you know, I think he worked on one of the, I think he was one of the leaders of the 25 person team that created Excel. I mean, he was just a prolific oh engineering leader <laughs> and he was so soulful about a sustainable kind of, you know, planet and how we could give back as a company. I just, I found him mag magnetic. Then I worked for Gary, who I agree. I mean, Gary for me has just been, he's a friend, he's a mentor, he's somebody who really was an ally when I came to Intuitive, but through my tenure at Outset, he's also just been a wonderful sounding board for me. And yeah. I always ask him, I'm like, why do you make the time? He's just he a told good me person. Once, yeah. He said, I, I always learn something. He said, Stace, if I come and meet with you, I always learn something. And I say, back at you. So we we are, are thick as thieves and I so enjoy it. And then, you know, I work for Leslie Trigg, mm -hmm. who for me is such an exceptional CEO because of the way she prepares. Mm -hmm. She, in any interaction, is going to get more information than anybody else. She's going to ask the right questions. She's going to be prepared. She's going to have thought through what she wants to get out of that interaction. She's going to be present. She, no phone is going to be picked up and put in her hand. I mean, she she's exceptional about giving you her best attention when she's in a moment with you. And I I learned so much from the way that she she leads. And she is just unbelievably present at all levels of the organization. And I've never seen anybody work harder. She is indefatigable, which I thought was not a word. I thought it was defatigable or infatigable. It I'm going to have to look that up and have it animated <laughs> over our screen for all listeners. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can't, you cannot tire her out. It is, it is virtually impossible. And I've worked with her for almost four and a half years. Well, the common denominator, in my opinion, of, of everyone we just referenced is they are not in it for power. Um, mm -hmm. leadership and power don't work. So if you're in it for the long haul, you're in it to bring the personal best out of everyone and you have an intention to drive everyone to the target, I think you'll win every time. But I think if you're in it to tell people how important you are and how little they are, you will fail. Right. Absolutely. So let me just ask you the final three questions, because I'm sure you're going to have great answers. And I ask everyone this. So number one, what is your superpower? I think I know, but I would love to know from you. What is, if you had to boil it down, whether it's your leadership superpower or just your overall professional superpower, what is the one thing? The one thing that I'm exceptionally good at and well-trained for and have honed a skill set in is building community. Mm. I can bring people together 
and I can have them feel like they belong to something that's beyond themselves. And um, it is one of the reasons that I, I think I've grown in these roles is because it used to be I'd bring leaders together to develop. Um, then it was I'd bring teams together to perform. And now I'm bringing cultures together to become durable and to scale and to do something in the world that makes the world better. That is awesome. I completely agree with you. In fact, I wrote in an earlier note that if you ever wanted to get out of the med tech industry, I think you have a job in like terrorism mediation, de-escalating situations, or marital mediation. You can find a way to bring people together that they all feel like they won and that they were all heard. And you do have that superpower of just making people feel not, like not threatened and that you genuinely care. And I think you do genuinely care. It's not something that you're putting on a facade about. I think you genuinely seek to understand. And that's that's how you solve problems and how you bring people together because they all feel like they can trust you. So that's awesome. Okay. Next one is who mentored you? I know you've been a mentor to me and several others, but who would you attribute, you know, how you've shaped your leadership style and your overall professional style, who do you want to honor or pay it forward to today? Well, we, we've talked a little bit about one of them, but I'll, I'll start in an unusual place. I, I have this unbelievable um, husband and he is, I, I'm just in awe of him. I think that what he has done with, creating his business in California. He's an architect. I mentioned he's got a design build firm. Um, I love to see the way that he interacts with clients. I love to see how he problem solves with them. He does residential remodeling. So he is going into homes and helping them determine how an existing structure can be a place that they want to live long-term in. Mm. And I'll never forget stepping in kind of a client meeting with him. We were going to lunch and we were stopping by on a Saturday and we were walking around this home and the client was looking at the footprint and talking about how they'd use the existing footprint. And he just kind of whipped around and he said, do you want the kitchen to be here? Cause it doesn't have to be here. And I was like, Oh, fall in love again, like 12 yeah. years later, because he just, he, he, he is so quietly confident and he mm. believes that you like, what is in front of you does not have to be what is in front of you. You can right. shape shift it to be what it needs to be. So, so he is most definitely not only the love of my life, but also just an incredible mentor for me. And then the second one, and we've talked about him, but, but Gary Goodhart, uh, CEO mm -hmm. of intuitive surgical, he became just an incredible ally for me. Yeah. And he also really pushed my thinking. Gary will not for one second allow you to be intellectually lazy, right. um, especially with his company. So when I came in and I was like, I'm going to do this and we're going to build this. <laughs> and he said, OK, what is the issue? What is the price of being wrong? And he would always ask me these like kind of mind bending questions about, you know, what if you're wrong? What if it doesn't work? Have we misused people's times? What do they get? I mean, he he really wants you to be to be convicted and to be convicted, not because of your own ego, but because of what's right for the individuals that you're serving. And Steph, one of the things that's been amazing is I probably spend more time with him now than I did at Intuitive, although we were just unbelievable allies at Intuitive, because he's continued to mentor me my, my whole career at Outset. We either grab coffee together for a while. We used to go on walks together um, and, and just talk and like kick things around. I've, I've kind of pre-called like presentations that I'm going to do to a broader audience with him before I've delivered them. Um, I, it's just a wonderful friendship. It's a mentorship that I don't deserve, but I get to take advantage of. Um, and it's been incredibly fueling. He is, a, he's a true leader, honestly. And I think there's so many people he's impacted and that's awesome that you have him as a mentor and have his ear. He's one of the smartest people I've ever come into contact with. He literally would go on record to be the only person that makes me nervous and not from anything that he does, but honestly, because I'm in such awe of his greatness that it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Tremendous. Okay. So the final question is uh, leadership books. You and I both, I see all of the books behind you 
it doesn't even need to be a leadership book, but a book that made an impact on your career that you would recommend for someone either going into being a chief people officer or going into a leadership role or a CEO role or any kind of people leading role. I have several as well. Um, but what's the one that impacted you the most and that you kind of use and frame your style and which one would you recommend if you can yeah. only pick one? If I can only pick one, it's going to surprise you, but it's the book Rework. And it's a book by, and I, I'm going to mess up the, the names, but it's, um, and stuff. it's on, where is it? It's on my um, uh, bookshelf here somewhere, and I can't put my eyes on it right this second. Sometimes I actually give it to people, and then I'm like, wait a second, bring that back to me. <laughs> um, but the, the It's called Rework, is, you said? Rework. Got it. Yeah. And it's by two individuals. They actually were software developers and they created this programming language called Ruby on Rails. And then they created these um, productivity tools. But what I love about Rework is that it is written from a perspective of when companies get big, people get small. Mm. And so it's like, how do you keep swiftness and smallness and the good things the about intimacy. being kind of fledgling yeah. uh, in a company without kind of getting too ahead of yourself or getting ego driven or getting undisciplined. And so it's got these different lessons and it's really in many ways, you could say it's about building, you know, kind of a SaaS or a software company, but it really has broader appeal. Um, and I just, I think it's exceptionally well-written. I think the, the messages are very kind of cogent and, and crisp and a current day. Um, I love it. I read it almost every year just to kind of refresh myself, just because I do, I do find so much value in the sim simple principles that it espouses. You know what I love about the, that book that you just brought up is I've never heard of it and I've never read it. So a lot of the books that it. we've all referenced, we've all read and, you know, everyone says the same thing at the podium. And so we all write it down and we all like one I'm right now, um, I just had shipped to me is Atomic Habits. Um, so I'm going to read that and then I'll let you know if it's something that's actually made an impact on me. But um, I'm definitely going to, if if you are impacted by it, I'm reading it. So rework Good. it is. It's worth it. It all is right. worth it. All right. Well, let me tell you something. This has been a pleasure. It's <laughs> honestly not work. It's so fun. And I actually got to know you more than I thought I knew you. Um, and just kind of got an opportunity to showcase what makes you great. And, um, so I, one day I would love to meet your husband because I'm sure his, he's as good, if not better, it sounds like than you, which is hard to he's do, better. hard he's to better. do. But again, shout out to the parents. Great job on Stacy. But honestly, I just think your, um, your approach to life, we need more of that. So if we can create more mini me's of Stacy out there that care, but also push and in the right way where people are motivated to do their very best. I think that's all we can ask for in the med tech industry. Let's not get too soft. Let's not go beyond high performance teams. Let's reward yeah. high performance teams. Let's not kill meritocracy. And um, just keep the conversation going, Stacey, because you're such a blessing. You're such a, fresh, a breath of fresh air to all of us. And it's so fun to talk to you. I feel like I just got like 10 IQ points smarter after this hour. <laughs> Steph, I, I have loved it. And you know what I love about the name of your agency is Tribe. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if I would leave on a note, it's that in the end of the day, at the end of the day, we don't work for any company. We work for our network. Right. And I will always put every molecule and every kind of good intention in my strengths and whatever I have to give into my network because that group supports each other. It has nothing to do with ego. It has nothing to do with, you know, this kind of bartering back and forth. And yes, there are things that, that, you know, we sign up and do for each other, but it's about kind of the rising of that collective. And so, um, again, I started with anything you say is a yes for me, but anything you say is a yes for me or ask. It's and yes. right back at you, you in that pink top. <laughs> as bright as the sun I mean just like your personality <laughs> all right well that concludes episode three with the brilliant Stacy Porter we look forward to serving you next time on leader podcast